my first thought was just complete excitement. Here we are, we've come all this way, we've gone through all this logistical hassle, it's been months of planning, and you're finally in the helicopter with all of the gear, and it's a beautiful day, and then you're off, and, and nothing can stop you now. Do you fly right over the Alulisat ice stream, which is this collection of jumbled bergs and brash ice that's kind of flowing out through a deep fjord. So at first, you're seeing right where the glacier meets the sea, and the ice sheet itself is full of these deep, deep cracks, and they're all in these very organized lines. And then you start to see lakes, and basically, in all the whiteness, you're just looking at this white sheet underneath you, and what you're seeing are these little tiny blue jewels that dot the ice sheet all over the place. And that's where we landed, right by one of those jewels. You know, as that helicopter flies away, you have this realization that it's just you and the ice and what you brought with you, and you really hope that you have everything you need. It's a long road between having an idea in your office and actually getting out in the field to make it happen. After a couple of attempts, we were successful in receiving a grant that allowed us to travel to Greenland and start doing our field work. One of the things that's changed even since I've been a student is our awareness of how the planet is warming up. This warming is amplified in the Arctic, where the Greenland ice sheet is located. And so a lot of our work now has been focused on trying to understand how the Greenland ice sheet may respond to this climate warming. The ice sheet holds enough water that if the entire ice sheet were to melt, it would raise the global sea level by over seven meters. In fact, over the last decade or so, it appears that it's been melting more and more rapidly and that we've been losing more ice to the ocean. There are over a thousand lakes that form on the margin of the Greenland ice sheet in the summertime, and we needed to pick just two to study in detail, and we ended up picking two lakes that we've creatively named North Lake and South Lake. So what we set about to do was to try to understand how you might be able to get the surface meltwater all the way to the bottom of the ice sheet in these thick, cold ice areas. And one idea that we had was that in regions of the ice sheet where you have meltwater lakes, they pool and collect meltwater throughout the summer, and you could use that pool of water to actually drive a crack down through the ice sheet and drain all of that meltwater to the base of the ice sheet. The water lubricates the base of the ice sheet, allowing the glaciers to flow faster towards the coast and discharge more ice to the ocean. As global temperatures rise, more lakes and cracks may form even further inland, accelerating the flow of ice to the sea. So we set about to test these theoretical models, which had been known for a few decades, but no one had actually observed this happening in these areas. It's foggy right now. Everything is kind of a light blue color. The sky is just white. We're in thick fog. It's hard to see anything, really. So before this year, everyone always asked me, well, what is it like when the lake drains? And I had to say, I don't know. I was never there. Standing on the shore of South Lake. It's about it's 8.45 p.m. local time. The ice has just started making some very disconcerting noises. The day that it drained, we didn't have any real knowledge that it was going to happen. It was exciting to think that it was dropping, but we really didn't think it was going to drain in a catastrophic fashion by splitting apart the bottom of the lake. There's these sounds exploding all around us. I also just heard kind of a deep bass rumble, like thunder way in the distance. It could be a big crack opening up. It really seemed to be like something violent was going on. 
and you couldn't actually see the lake anymore. There was just no more water left to see. This is probably the first time that people have actually witnessed this happening, the water draining out of the lake. It's amazing. You got the sense that the ice sheet itself was crumbling under your feet. And you sort of looked at each other and looked at your camp and hoped that a large gaping hole didn't open up underneath you. And after a couple of hours, all the noise stopped. Everything seemed to go quiet again. And we decided, well, we'll go for a hike. <laughs> we traced our route that we had done the previous day back along the ice edge and came across a giant crack. And the crack was running basically from outside the lake basin right through the middle of the lake basin to the other side. Just a monstrous crack. It's impossible to get up underneath an ice sheet yourself, so you're left with trying to come up with experiments that help you probe that environment remotely. We had come up with an idea to put a harmless fluorescent dye into one of the crevasses close to where our team was working, and to have another team 25 miles away on the coast try to detect it as it came out in the fjord. We can't pick up the ice sheet and see underneath it, so our idea was to try to paint a picture of water flow patterns under the ice using this dye. Unfortunately, we never found the dye on the coast. We're still sort of wondering where it went. What we were really trying to do was understand the processes that are happening underneath the ice. So once the water gets to the bottom of the ice sheet, what path does it take? How long does it take to get out to the sea? And that's a very important question if we want to understand the impact of this water on the ice flow. We've really been able to uncover a very new understanding of how meltwater flows around on the surface of the ice in the regions where these lakes form, as well as uh, how the water drains to the bed and what the impact is on ice flow. And um, of course, as a scientist, every discovery leads to more questions. So what we hope to do in the next few years is probe the processes a little more deeply. Once we have a much clearer understanding, those fundamental processes can then be scaled into ice sheet models which people use to then predict the future behavior of ice, say, for the next 10 years or 100 years or 1,000 years. I think in the end, what the public is really interested in is how will sea level change on those timescales? How will this impact me? Are we in trouble? It seems now unequivocally clear that climate is warming on the planet and it's largely induced by human activity. It's amplified in the Arctic and Greenland in particular is quite sensitive. Greenland is losing more and more ice each year as this happens. So in the sense that we as a society have to worry about uh, increasing rates of sea level rise into the future, I think we absolutely do. As we were getting ready to go, we were waiting for this giant helicopter. And I remember everybody sitting on top of the piles of gear. And we were thinking, is it going to come? And I still remember the moment when we saw it. We look over the horizon, and I'm like, what is that? It's this giant red and white helicopter coming. And it's a Sikorsky. It's a Sikorsky. And then it came, and it was like a hurricane when that thing landed. It just blew, <laughs> blew snow and ice chips all over us. And, but we were so happy. 